Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. I really feel strongly that what the Lord has been speaking lately is, matter of fact, there's even a scripture for it, and uh, I'm reading out of the Amplified. Uh, uh, Matthew 13, 52 in the Amplified. And I believe it's going to apply to each and every one of us. So uh, when you hear something, don't say, I know that. Say, I'm going to know that in a deeper, much richer way. God's going to re- re- increase. Uh, Jesus, he said to them, Therefore, teacher and interpreter of the sacred writings, who has been instructed about and trained for kingdom of God, who has become a disciple, he is like a householder who brings forth out of his storehouse treasure that is new, treasure that is old the fresh as well as the familiar. And uh, those of you that have been part of us for a long time, you know that uh, last Sunday's message on uh, Jehovah Jireh, he actually took it to a far deeper uh, understanding in my personal life than I understood all the years that I taught it. And I believe he wants to do that for all of us. Take something that you know and realize how little of it really sank in when God reveals more, right? Well, Jehovah Jireh, the big revelation on that one for me was that the provision is in you and provision in the message translation said to soak in it, soak in provision. And see, I was always thinking provision, you soak in God, but provision is there outside of you. And it is, and it includes that. But there needs to be a revamping that provision is a person, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And walking in that relationship with him, you start from the place of provision, and then you you begin to get the wisdom on how to walk it out in day-to-day life rather than uh, trial and error a million different times. Uh, well, today's message is on peace. Jehovah Shalom, if you, for, if you like. But starting, uh, God has taken this different. As a matter of fact, uh, Shalom by definition Again, our emphasis is Ephesians 2.14. He himself is our peace. It's not an it. It's not just a thing. Peace is the supernatural presence of a living God. Jehovah Shalom. And uh, the revelation that God gave me many years ago about the revelation of one new man and uh, came out of Judges. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he called him Almighty Man of Valor. This was a guy who was hiding away. <laughs> Almighty Man of Valor. Oh, you mighty warrior. All right. And uh, the Lord and the Lord turned to him and said, Go, Almighty Man of Valor. Go in this step, your power, and save Israel from the Midianites. Save Israel from the Midianites. Here, then comes the excuses. Uh, well, uh, how can I save Israel? Israel. My clan is the smallest and the weakest. Uh, I am the least of my father's house. Uh, you know, God answers the same way to every one of these notable people in the scriptures. What does he say? I am with you. That revelation needs to increase in all areas. I am with you. I am that I am. That I am that you need is with you. Now, the Lord says, surely you will, I will be with you and you will defeat the Midianites as one man. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now, Gideon received that this was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, alas, O Lord, for I have seen the angel of the Lord and I have fear that I'm going to die. Uh, a very positive guy, wasn't he? <laughs> uh, then the Lord said, peace be be with you, do not fear, you're not going to die. This is the guy that's going to make the mighty man of valor. So if you ever feel a little like a a wimp, there's hope for you. God factored that in and said, I have a solution, and it's me. So 
All right. <laughs> so Gideon uh, perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Peace be with you. Do not fear. You will not die. So Gideon built an altar there, and he called the name of it, The Lord is Peace, or Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is Peace. And this is a truth uh, that we've seen in our ministry. The most effective, life-changing people are people that caught on to the supernatural presence of God's peace. Peace and forgiveness. We always sit in this church. If we ask you a question, you don't know the answer. Say peace or forgiveness, and you're probably all right. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good default answer. Uh, even if you don't know the answer. But uh, Jehovah Shalom, I was impressed uh, way back in 1980, uh, approximately 80. Jennifer will correct me. It was either 79 or 81, but well, she's got all the stats somewhere. A long time ago, uh, uh, God basically said the strategy for the end times will be to strike the enemy as one man. It won't be in numbers It'll be in unity. And even, even the enemy here, it says, you will strike the enemy, meaning the Midianites, as one man, as a corporate man. And a corporate man is merely a group of people who've come together in unity. And even the enemy had a dream and said, I saw a loaf of barley bread roll into the camp and destroy our camp. Truly, this was, must be Gideon. So a loaf, symbolic of even the way we were doing communion on Tuesday nights, that we are one bread, we are one loaf, and we've scattered and God is drawn together, together in one. And that unity cannot be underestimated because in that is essential. I believe Tuesday has taught us to come relationally together, and Sunday morning is decreeing and declaring out of that unity. You need both. And uh, so uh, he named that place Jehovah Shalom. Isn't that interesting that he named, and this is something we've been trying to get across for years, and I mean years, is to properly understand the supernatural power of peace, you have to see the militant side, not the passive side. If you see only the passive side, peace for you is like being a doormat, somebody walking all over me, uh, controlling me. That's, that's, that's the concept. But in reality, he's making a mighty warrior out of Gideon, and how did he appear to him? You know, when, when Jesus appears to you supernaturally in a Christophany, and he appears with a particular attribute, that attribute is the solution. And to make a frightened person a mighty warrior, what, he's, what really impressed me from the very beginning is I didn't hear people teaching on peace, and it's on every page in your Bible. And it's one of the least taught subjects. Like it's just a salutation. Like, hey, how you doing? Okay, peace. Peace be with you. Peace. And treat it as some kind of a mild situation. But appearing to him as Jehovah Shalom, he's saying, and, and, and that also brings up the question, why in the New Testament did the God of peace crush Satan beneath your feet? The missing element is the militancy of it and the power that's in it. And I believe that everything God taught back then, and we've uh, repeated it many times here, I believe that God is pulling something new out of it, something fresh and familiar to an old theme. And he's going to bring up the peace of God to a new dimension. Now, in, uh, in, in, in the concept of peace, I think our English word does it a great injustice, but shalom... Uh, Here's, here's just a kind of a picture of what it is. And it's completeness, shalom, completeness, wholeness. Tell me if there's something here you don't want. Just raise your hand and say, I don't need that. I got plenty. Completeness, wholeness, peace, health and healing, welfare, safety, salvation, deliverance. I hope nobody raised their hand on salvation. Okay. All right. Deliverance, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, rest, harmony, unity, absence of agitation or discord, total well-being. And I, when we had uh, Bill Morford in our church, he used to like to add 
all things intact, nothing missing. It would be nice to know you don't have any missing parts, right? Huh? Parts are not just parts. That's important. That everything is intact and there's nothing missing. That's complete. Now, friendship. But the part that I want to emphasize is, and there's a lot of parts I want to emphasize, but primarily peace is a person. He himself, Ephesians 2.14, he himself is our peace. If we look at peace as an it or just a fruit, you're going, you're going to miss the essential life change that is necessary for every believer. And uh, uh, Jennifer said, well, why would they want this? Uh, well, let's, let's reverse that. Why would you not want completeness, wholeness, peace, health. You know, there are, there are probably billionaires around the world that would give billions and millions if they could have a moment's peace. Uh, it's a commodity in the world that can't give it. Jesus said, my peace I give not as the world gives. So no matter what they're doing as a substitute for that peace, it's not of any value compared to what comes from God. But, I believe the church needs to know how to get it better. So we're going to move in that. Peace is a person. And uh, I'm going to throw this in before I even get started because this is the way the Lord uh, quickened it to me. I've taught over and over again that God builds according to a pattern based on principles. And some of those principles are just the way the Holy Spirit works. All right. And the, uh, I used the initial when we traveled and we were going church to church. It seemed like every church got uh, got that message to some degree. And I could just call it Jada because that was an easy way to remember the order. <laughs> Jada, J-A-D-A. So if you're a note taker, write down J-A-D-A because this will essentially be you evaluating your Christian walk. And here's uh, the key. J is for jurisdiction. You have a, uh, been assigned a place to live, a place to work, a place, people in your neighborhood, whatever. Jurisdiction has been assigned by God. You more or less cooperate with it, but uh, <laughs> that's up to you. But there is an assignment of people that he brings into your life. There's a jurisdiction. And jurisdiction has to be understood before you can do the second step. And that's adjudicate. That's just a big fancy word for rule with authority. Adjudicate in your jurisdiction. Adjudicate in your jurisdiction. You know what I mean by your jurisdiction? Your family, your home, your neighborhood, your job. Okay? The people that God has brought into your life. You have a responsibility to respond. Now, there's the key. I think... God wants, is going to take this understanding of our jurisdiction far more seriously. And it's not about changing our circumstances or changing other people. It's about responding properly in the midst of our jurisdiction. Uh, I once had a person that was uh, frustrated in a church situation, and, and uh, I can remember the advice he was getting from a pastor friend of mine. He said, well, look, either you change, they change, or it tells you you stayed too long. Think about that. If you can't change and you can't respect, they didn't change, you don't make somebody else change, then perhaps you stayed too long. I thought that was pretty sound wisdom because the, the pain of indecision I've seen in people's lives. You can stay in indecision for a long time. And it's pain if I stay and a pain if I go. But God's basically going to bring to the point where you want what God wants and not live in that kind of unnecessary trials and tribulations, unnecessary pain. So you understand your jurisdiction, but here's where we go wrong even in jurisdiction. I've done this myself. I was taught from the time I was a, a little boy to be responsible. Anybody else been taught to be responsible? But what happens when you're responsible in your jurisdiction? And you're taught. You could very easily take matters into your own hands and try to rule. And that's my point. God has taken us deeper in the understanding of our jurisdiction with Jehovah Shalom. 
and you're going to see the blessing of the fruit of it. We have people that are going through the peace challenge. And unless you know how to deal with toxic emotions, the peace challenge isn't, it's, it's going to frustrate you. But the peace challenge is a person. The peace is a person. But in, just like Jehovah Jireh, in the message it says, steep yourself in God reality. Okay, I'm in his presence. I'm praying. I'm, I can feel his presence. I'm steeping myself in God reality. It says, steep yourself in God initiative. Uh, this is the part where in jurisdiction you mess up. Steep yourself in God initiative. In other words, I'm going to wait for the prompting of the Lord. I want, the, I want that internal yes or no. My spirit's going to bear witness with his spirit that I'm a child of God, but I also have the capacity within me, and we all have that capacity. Some exercise it more than others. But in that exercising of that capacity, you learn the promptings of the spirit where it's yes, no. Green light, red light. Call it what you want. Uh, Bill Morford used to tell us when he was in our church, the... Uh, he said, my wife's got better discernment than I do. I'll tell you what. So the only conclusion we came up with, and he had to admit that she was right more than he was more often than not. A brilliant scholar, but his wife was right more often than he was. So what he did was, he says, we pray together, and if we both get a green light, we do it. If we get a green light and a red light, we're going to stay in prayer till the light changes, <laughs> one way or the other. Yellow light, that just means wait. You didn't wait long enough. You rushed it. You rushed it. But he prayed until husband and wife had green light, two green lights, two red lights. And at least you're moving in the realm of responsibility. But see, responsibility was beat into our heads as children in a lot of cases. And so responsibility, you begin to micromanage, you begin to uh, be general manager of the universe. I, I mean, I've never done it. <laughs> I just campaign occasionally, right? But it comes out of being responsible for your jurisdiction. Like this church, I will stand before the Lord for this church, not you. You will stand before the Lord for your jurisdiction. And so, but I don't have to help him out, right? Don't they say it's, it's God's flock, not your flock. But then he called the apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers and gave them authority to serve. But I'm going to be held accountable for my serving. Otherwise, why bother giving them? It's God's church. I'll just let it, let it go. There's a proper way to steward. And when you steward from the supernatural peace of God, your job, your home, your relationships will all go smoother. Peace let the peace of God rule. What the, who, who's ruling if the peace of God rules? Jesus. So you're going to have to look for any false responsibility that you've taken because it's ruined lives. And hurt people hurt people. And you get hurt. It's not us or them. It's God himself. And he's looking at your response. Uh, you know, my driving is, to me is like, I think everybody should have taken Dennis Clark's driving course. And I have a bumper sticker. Uh, you know, I took Dennis Clark. But you know what? They don't comply on the road. And the best sermon I ever got was Jennifer preaching to me in the kitchen. Honey, the road, this is Jennifer's style now. Honey, that, that's when I know I'm in trouble already. <laughs> The road is a microcosm of the kingdom. All right, I know where this is going. I'm repenting on the inside already. The road is a microcosm of the kingdom. And it's not your road. That was a shock right there. It's not your road. It's God's road. Oh, it gets worse. Then she hesitates and then she says, and God placed those people on the road exactly where he wants to. But in the kingdom, you have a responsibility to respond. You know, that person in the passing lane going 20 miles below the speed limit? God will let you see what's in your heart. <laughs> Isn't that marvelous that he has that all, all of that planned out? 
I told you, my jurisdiction was when I go to Publix, I take my cart and I bring it back. I watch people leave their carts up there, scratch on the other cars, leave it out in the middle to where you can't park there and everything. And that really bothered me. And God says, does it really bother you? It's not your parking lot. You're not the general manager of Publix grocery store either. Oh, as a matter of fact, why not while no one's looking? Why don't you take one of those carts back yourself as an act of kindness and do it unto me? Oh, there goes my whole theory just went out the window. Those incompetent people who walk through Costco and the grocery store for six miles with that cart, and then suddenly they get to their car and they're exhausted? Yeah. Why don't you show an act of kindness and take that cart back? So you know what I learned? After you take the cart back one time, you shut up. <laughs> You, you have too many opinions, Dennis, that are not in your jurisdiction. But God says, okay, so you can get convicted like that when it's not your jurisdiction. But then you, now you've got to switch over to a, a deepening dimension in your jurisdiction. Is the peace of God ruling in this situation? Because then you'll respond out of the peace. I like that Jesus said, the peace that I gave you is not like the world. <laughs> oh, so there's a peace that the world has. Mm -hmm. I led a girl to the Lord whose husband was a Buddhist. And when she got saved, she goes, this is the real peace. This is not what my husband talks about. So as a Buddhist, he talked about peace. But she said, this is the real thing. Yeah, because this is a person. This is not an it. This is not the absence of agitation or conflict. This is a person. Jehovah Shalom. And he's appearing to you in a militant way, not a passive way alone. That's the missing ingredient for the most part. If he's militant, then that Shalom, completeness, wholeness, peace, health, healing, welfare, from that, he is in you. What got my attention with Jehovah Jireh, my provider, my God shall supply all of your need according to What got my attention was in the message it says, soak in God reality, soak in God initiative. And I understood those. Soak and wait for God's prompting. Wait for the green light. Not your good ideas. Wait for the green light, that internal yes. And live that faithfully before the Lord. You honor God. But I didn't pay attention to soak in God's provision. I'm going, now how do you soak in God's provision? Provision is whether he provides it in whatever way, shape, or form he does it. Yeah, that's the outworking of it, but the inworking of it, soak yourself in Jehovah Jireh and get to know him as a person to where you're coming from that finished work. You're coming from the place that he's a person and he's where the provision comes. Okay, now with the supernatural peace of God, deliverance, soundness, tranquility, well being, all things intact, nothing missing. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Uh, by the way, I want to start with, I, I think I'm going to get go backwards here a little bit. Here's something I think we need to take note of particular in Kingdom Life Church where you've heard peace, 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 forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. And forgiveness is nothing more than what you're supposed to go preach forgiveness in two different biblical accounts, that that's where the rubber meets the road. The gospel is the love message. The love message where the rubber meets the road is forgiveness. That's the way you work it out because you're not perfect people. Now, listen to this. According to Bible scholars, 10 of the 25 New Testament theology textbooks have no subject index for peace. Almost like it's a non-essential. The term peace occurs 100 times in the New Testament and is in every one of the canonical, ooh, canonical books, Bible books, except 1 John, and yet scholars consistently undervalue 
the aspect of Jesus' teaching. I, I ask uh, Bill Morford, he studied under Eleazar ben Yehuda's great grandson, the man who brought the Hebrew language back to Israel. And I asked him about that. Why is it not mentioned? And he says, the one thing he says that you've affirmed for me, Dennis, with all his scholarship and understanding, he said, you have more confidence in the peace of God than all the reasoning put together. Because uh, you can build a case for anything. True or otherwise, you can build a case. But peace is the wisdom of God in application. It's the person of God in application. And you, it's like the word of your testimony. What are you gonna, how are you going to deny that? And we need to get them to the word of our testimony. Uh, and test, peace is actually the breath of God, the spirit of God. And peace is just a poor English word to define what it means in, as far as shalom. Uh, in Christ Jesus, you were once were far off. You've been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our shalom. In his flesh, he has made two groups one. In his flesh, this, he's a person. And you, he became and proclaimed shalom to you who are far off and shalom to those who were near. And... Uh, but shalom has within it the breath and the spirit of our creator. It should be something that we don't just go, oh, at least right now there's no conflict in my life. Uh, things are going pretty good so far. It's been 10 minutes now. And, and, okay. It's not about nonviolence or uh, no hostilities. To translate it as peace fails to capture the fuller meaning in the Hebrew. Shalom certainly includes an absence of war, commitment, and nonviolence, but it has as much to do with personal wholeness and social harmony. The definition with which I am most drawn to is that shalom has to do with seeking the well being of everyone. Shalom embraces justice, peace with oneself, then with others, and with God. Now, uh, it's a word of hope. And shalom has to do with the living God's way with others and society in the created order. Now, here's a word you probably never heard in this church, yielding. <laughs> we receive shalom through spiritual yielding. It's a decision to be receptive. I'm hoping you're going to take notes to this and you are going to make a decision that I'm going to yield to it. It's available, but I can go my own way or I can yield to it. The supremacy of it is untold, but until it's, un until it's tried, it's unknown. We receive shalom through spiritual yielding. It's a decision to be receptive to the spirit within. The key is not to seize control. If anybody messes up in their jurisdiction, it's because you tried to control rather than yield to God and respond to the circumstances accordingly. And, and that doesn't mean you're silent and that you're passive and you're a doormat. It simply means that your yes is yes, your no is no, and anything else is manipulation. Manipulation or control. So you're going to be messing around with witchcraft if you're not careful. Your better choice is to yield. So it isn't something to accomplish either. We want you to receive the gift of shalom. That's ask and you shall receive. Receive the gift. It doesn't mean you earn it. It means you yield to it. So we receive through spiritual yielding, and we receive shalom through intentional yielding. It's an act of the will. A person once interpreted what we teach here as intentional sanctification, and I thought that was very perceptive of them. Because sanctification, spirit, soul, and body, doesn't just fall out of the sky. There is a yielding of your will to the will of God. You seek shalom first, and everything else will fall into place. It's really <clears throat> intentional yielding is an action of the will that can be expressed in three words. Seek shalom first. <laughs> this is not complicated, is it? Seek shalom first and everything will fall into place. Seek wholeness first. 
seek the fulfillment of everyone else first, seek society harmony first, seek the healing of the environment first, seek personal and global reconciliation first, seek personal healing first. If it isn't shalom, don't put it first. <laughs> if it's not peace, don't put it first. No matter how right you think you are. If it's not peace, you're putting something, be you're putting something before God. Striving. Trying. But I'm saying for my upbringing, I say learning that to fall into a, a yielded life more completely and fully usually got confused with the when I said the jada, jurisdiction, rule, adjudicate, displacement. That's the victory you want. The displacement where the presence of God displaces everything negative, the world of flesh and the devil. And once displacement takes place, you're advancing. God said, Kingdom Life Church, full stature ministries, it's time to advance beyond what you say. I already know this. The vast majority of the churches when we travel don't know this. And if they know it, they're not practicing it because they're taking control instead in their jurisdiction, calling it responsibility. Now, we saw that when we traveled in New England a lot. It was called uh, <laughs> a work ethic. How you doing today? Uh, frazzle, uh, uh, worn out. And we're supposed to see that as a badge of honor because if you're fried, you've got a good work ethic, you're not lazy. Well, stop being fried. That's telling me that part of you isn't yielding to God. Part of you is doing in your own strength what God would have liked to help you with. I've often said it, but maybe you don't like it. Accomplish more with less effort. Raise your hand if you don't like that. Nah. Now, I like the striving. It makes me feel that adrenaline rush. And then that burnout where I just, uh, I can't do nothing. <laughs> you really like that? That should be something you're looking to overcome, not something you want to be addicted to. Be addicted to the ministry to the saints. If you're going to be addicted, that's scriptural. All right, now let's, let's go. So peace and yielding. You know, Derek Prince had a little booklet many years ago, and he was probably the only one I ever heard of that talked about it, the grace of yielding. <laughs> the old-time songs, I surrender all. But after that, nobody wants to do it. <laughs> it's just like, I'm in the driver's seat. That's my road. And it's so funny, on the road, too, will really test your jurisdiction. It's just because there's, there's automobiles on the road doesn't mean there's not people inside those automobiles. Would you have the same attitude if you were in the grocery store and they were uh, where you could see them face to face? You're out of my way. Oh, man, can't you move faster in that aisle? I see that cane, but still, you're in my way. <laughs> I'm in the passing lane in the grocery store, and you're going, ooh, poking around. All right. So if it's not shalom, don't put it first. Uh, and nearly all of the scholars agree the kingdom of God is the core of Jesus' teaching. But a kingdom of love and forgiveness is really what it's about. And that just reeks of yielding and surrendering. A kingdom of expanding. And here's the part that I find interesting. Uh, and it's not taught much, but there is a, uh, uh, we know in the scriptures, Isaiah 9, I talked about Gideon, and you shall strike the enemy as one man. And it was Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace, who was emanating the supernatural peace of God. But it was the militant power of the peace of God to say, with a small amount of people with that anointing, you will take care of the enemy. So it's not in numbers, and that's why so many miracles were done in biblical proportions, because it was the core of obedient that did to work. And when 
I was sitting there and God says, in the end times, Dennis, you're going to see. It's going to be striking the enemy as one man. It's going to be the unity that does the work. Unity is going to be essential. And then I went and the Lord had me turn. I was outside sitting in a uh, swing under a tree. And all of a sudden I saw Isaiah 9. For a people who sit in darkness shall see a great light. And they will overcome him as in the day of Midian. <clears throat> That's Gideon. Gideon overcame the Midianites. How a great light shined in the midst of darkness. They, they smashed those pitchers and the, the torches within the pitchers shined a light and the enemy turned on each other. I always like that part where the enemy turns on itself. That's the dangerous thing about a lynch mob. You might be part of a lynch mob, but guess what? If they did it to Harry, they could do it to you too. They could turn. <laughs> if they did it to one of them, they could do it to you. All right, but anyway, uh, that was a messianic prophecy that light will come into the world, Jesus Christ. Light will come into the world and dispel the darkness. But a people who sit in darkness shall see a great light. And who, who, what was the beginning of that? They called him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually and there'll be an endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. An endless peace. So there's an expansion of this kingdom of peace through individuals. It says, the beautiful thing about this peace is it can appear like this now. You can yield to it instantly, but it can progress forevermore. It's never going to be taken away. That covenant of peace isn't going anywhere. So whatever you experience now is not going to be lost. It doesn't go down the drain, but it can increase incrementally in your lifestyle and in your jurisdiction. It, two beautiful factors breaks into the present moment. If you're a note taker, I'd write that down. Peace breaks it. That means no matter how upset you are, you can go to peace now, instantly. Instantly. I receive forgiveness for allowing all that foul emotions to enter into my spirit. Release forgiveness to whosoever. If it's circumstances, I release that judgment I made against God. So this peace breaks into the present, but it's a vision of what can be yours in the future and what will be a covenant that God made forevermore. Now these remain faith, hope, and love, these three, and the greatest of these is love. What is love? What is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, and joy. That's love in action. Righteousness, peace, and joy. It can break into the present, but it's a vision of what can be in the future. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, the king of peace. Understanding that Melchizedek, whom Abraham gave a tenth of all, first being translated king of righteousness, is also called king of peace. Now, I know that there's people that disagree on it, but I'm sorry. I'm convinced that's a theophany, that uh, you don't pay tithes to a foreign king. <clears throat> and it's an order according to Melchizedek in Hebrews. Um, there was tithing before the law, tithing in the law. And as uh, Bill Morfer says, it's, tithing is mentioned 10 times in the New Testament, but never once does it say not to. Uh, when we studied the Didache, the early church, before they had a New Testament, what did they do? They said, you support, you support your teachers, prophets, what have you, as you met in houses, rooms, which Jennifer did a lot of research on that. It wasn't just houses. Some people are trying to propagate that. No, they met house to house. That's true but workshops, rental buildings, whatever they could get. Actually, almost like today, you see storefronts, da da. But anyway, 
king of peace, his Melchizedek, king of peace. It also says <clears throat> in First Thessalonians, now may the God of peace himself. Who? What God? Where's this peace coming from all the time? If no one's teaching about it, why is it everywhere? All the way back to the king of peace from the time of Abraham, tithing to Melchizedek, to the king of peace, and the God of peace, sanctify you intentionally, intentional sanctification. May the God of peace, what? The God of peace? What about just Jesus? Why not just say Jesus? The God of peace sanctify you spirit, soul, and body. Why? Because shalom has wholeness, relationship, friendship, everything intact for society, your home, and your marriage. It's all encompassed in there. Without that, you don't really have anything. Without peace, you're falling apart. You're disheveled. You need to be drawn together with cords of love, and it's going to require that supernatural peace of God. And yet that's one of the least taught subjects, even by scholars. No index for peace, and yet it's everywhere. And yet it's the person of the Lord Jesus himself, the Prince of Peace. And by the way, Prince is a horrible translation because that almost makes him sound second class. No, he's king. He's king. And uh, Jennifer can do a teaching on that called, she's going to, so I won't tell you what she's going to teach on that. I won't say it. I'm gonna, I don't have a green light. I have a, Oh, no, nah, nah, save that. Let Jennifer teach on that. All right. All right, so, but the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy. It shows up everywhere. Don't you think it ought to be something that we're well aware of and practicing on a routine basis with regularity, knowing that it's going to expand forever, that covenant of peace is going to go on forever. It's available immediately, but it's also your future. I want peace in my future. You want peace in your future? Yeah. Peace, completeness, wholeness, health, healing, welfare, safety, salvation, deliverance, soundness, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, rest, all things intact, nothing missing, the absence of agitation or discord. I like that. Jehovah, or Jehovah Shalom is the name that Gideon gave for the altar that he even erected there. Now, he became a mighty warrior. Why did God say, and I'm going to appear to Gideon as the warrior God, the commander-in-chief of the heavenly host, to be accurate. But he came to him as peace. The, the God of peace crushed Satan beneath your feet is still the missing ingredient in the church. They fail to see that it's militant. It's not just passive. It's not, oh, well. We fight by yielding, and we live by dying. Oh, that sounds real uh, exciting, but that's it. It's intentional yielding. It's spiritual yielding to the person of Jehovah Shalom. He's a person. I don't know if we're going to get all this in, but... Look at it in this outline, at least. He's a person. It's a plan that will get you on track for your life. <clears throat> it's a place. It's a place where you abide. It's a habitation. And it also can be in the atmosphere as a habitation for people to bear witness to it. Uh, I've been to funerals where there were Christians and non-Christians alike. And I found it profoundly insightful that the unsaved Christians at the funeral, I mean the unsaved, said, there's something in the atmosphere, I can't put my finger on it. Isn't that something? What they were feeling was the fruit of the Spirit. They were feeling the peace of God. They were feeling that people had resolved certain things in God, they've grieved, they've, but the peace then transcends. I've also done funerals where the woman or the wife in, in, in several cases 
was confessing that she felt bad that she had such peace. Because everybody's saying, wow, she mustn't have loved him very much. She's not, she's not devastated. She's not throwing herself on the casket. You know, by the way, if you attend the funeral, shut up. <laughs> I'm giving you wisdom from above. Don't talk. Give your condolences and then don't give an opinion. <laughs> oh, man. How many people I had to counsel over the years that went to a funeral and somebody gave them an opinion? They said all kinds of crazy things. They're trying to help, but you're better off if you don't know. Give them your time. And by the way, if it's a funeral, if it's a funeral, wait for, wait for 30 days after the funeral, then offer to assist them. Because by that time, everybody forgot about it. That's, that's your free part today. I hope you didn't lose your peace. <laughs> But the power of peace is warfare, and it's the government of peace. It's, it's his authority, and yet he's willing to give it to us. Now, Jennifer likes the story of the night because that's where I went into <laughs> the first dimension. Sid has a, what do you call it, reenactment. But Jennifer wants the story all the time. She likes it. So if there's anybody watching it that hasn't heard this story a hundred times, when I was a young Christian, I worked in a halfway house, guys that were let out of prison. And um, I worked as a volunteer, and one of the guys, all of a sudden, I could feel it discernment-wise, the atmosphere got tense. And in the past, I talked to one of the pastors that was in charge there, and he says, in the past, when it feels tense in the atmosphere, somebody's going to make a break for it. They're going to they're gonna try to leave on their own accord. And the procedure then is you call the police, <laughs> you let them handle it uh, but we're in the kitchen and to this day I know God wants to bring this to the church universal he didn't do this for no reason I'm in the kitchen and a guy pulls a knife out and, he, and I'm standing by the exit and the supernatural peace of God with a knife pointing at me and threats increased now how do you make that happen how do you make that happen? You don't make that happen. But you know what I did? Even with a knife at me and all kinds of verbal threats, I kept my peace and it was increasing. You know what that tells me? I have more confidence than this is where we talked to Bill Morford about. I have more confidence in that than all your opinions. And it increased. So I'm thinking if peace increased when somebody has a knife to you, and if, he, if it doesn't increase, get out of the way. You know, common sense. But it increased. I had more confidence in God. And the next thing you know, I saw Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace, crush whatever was motivating that young man to death to where his hand started to shake and he dropped the knife. And then they gave him medication that he didn't take, that he was supposed to take. That's a one-time depth of dimension of the supernatural peace of God as militant, not passive. And if God of all you, why did God use that term? And the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. Why didn't he say the warrior God, the commander in chief? Yeah. Because there's a significance there that we're overlooking and we're moving it to a lower shelf of interest when in reality it should be seek the peace first and all these other things will be added to you now got a few minutes here I want to talk about that it's a person and you're going to get ingrained with that that he's the king of peace it's love and action righteousness is love and action righteousness peace and joy you're supposed to be living in that that's the kingdom if you're not living in if you're not living primarily in the peace of God, whatever you're doing is not Christianity. You're, you're missing. You might be into religion. You might be into appearances. You might even be into responsibility. But if it doesn't have peace with it, what good is it? It's the government of peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So it's available now and it's forevermore. 
That's a good deal. It's not going to run out. You just have to go there. But victory within has to be established first. He wants to, he wants to expand that kingdom through you, but it has to begin in you before he can expand it through you. Now, the plan, that's pieces of person. You've got that. We'll beat you over the head with that this morning. Now it's a plan. A kingdom environment affects the world of flesh and the devil. And I've told a story before about how I had a young woman in my first pastorate that was, she was just like the epitome of high anxiety. It was like a little chihuahua all the time, like, like that. And until she learned, she used to ask to stand next to me just to feel peace coming from me. She had to learn, of course, how to get it herself, and she did in time. It wasn't fast, though, I noticed. It was difficult because she had lived her whole life in high anxiety that anxiousness was normal. And then, you, and then what do normal people who have normal anxiety all the time say? That's just the way I am. Well, you need I am. You need the I am that I am that you need, and you need the peace I am. I am your peace. Now, in that, in that plan, it says that that's evidence of the kingdom. And you know what? We're not supposed to judge, but you know what? You can be a fruit inspector. By their fruit, you shall know them. You want to know if a person's a Christian? It's like uh, my sister dated a Jewish man before she was even saved. And then she gets saved, and she was asking me, she said, the, the guy that I was dating that was Jewish, you know what his father told him? He says, so you're dating a, a, a Gentile and Christian. And he said, he said, yeah, Dad, I am. He said, well, is she a real one? He said, because I'll tell you, this is a Jewish man who is not a convert. He said, if you ever meet a real Christian, you'll never forget them the rest of your life. That's the kind of Christian you want to be, huh? By their fruit, you shall know them. You meet a real one, you'll never forget them the rest of your life. So it's not by beating them over the head with the Bible. It's not by proof texting and arguing scripture. It's simply by righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom. Now, <clears throat> the kingdom is planted within. It's available and God wants us to be rooted and grounded. So it's a person, it's a plan, it's a place. It's with you and in you. Be not afraid. I leave my peace with you, my peace I give you, not as the world. So don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, because that's what robs you of the peace. Peace grows, develops intimacy. We used to say, when you say, I do, in a wedding, I do, use those three initials, intimacy, dependency, and obedience. Then you're, then, then you're part of the bride of Jesus. I do. Intimacy, dependency, and obedience. Say, I do to God before you say, I do to somebody else. All right. Peace is a place, and peace is a purpose. And I always thought it was important to see the progression of it. And where I believe God is taking us now is we're going to walk in the relationship of Jehovah Shalom as a person. He, he himself is our peace. It has to go beyond intellectual understanding of that to an internal demonstration of it, to where you emanate that. And uh, even Billy Graham used to teach the three, the three parts that were quite simple to understand. When you get saved, you make your peace with God. Finally, there's a connection. But there should be an inner assurance of peace that you actually ask Jesus to come into your heart and cleanse you of your sin. There should be a no-so. Your spirit should bear witness with your spirit that he's a child of God. His spirit and your spirit should bear witness that I am a child of God. I have to know in my knower. That's peace with God. Then what you have is the peace of God. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. I'll tell you what, standing there with a guy pulling a knife to me, that surpassed my understanding. But I tell you what, later on I saw 
I don't want anything else but that. And the places, if, it, if you mess up or it gets confused, it's in your jurisdiction. The rule and reign, you start to take matters into your own hands to fix it. If you're in the right place at the right time, and you're in the place of peace, then you shall go forth in peace. Peace with God, the peace of God, and this is what thus saith the Lord for full stature, kingdom life, people. I don't care how many times you've heard it, God's taken it to a new level. He's taken out of the treasure house uh, fresh as well as familiar, and he's going to give it that freshness that we need. And that's going to be the revelation of the God of peace. And he's going to crush the Satan beneath your feet. And that story of the knife needs to be your experience in your jurisdiction. But it doesn't work. That scripture that came up this week, I shared it. I shared it with Greg, that, that one that I saw about don't worry beforehand what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you in that moment. There has to be a greater confidence that the Holy Spirit will help me at the moment. At the moment. That does not mean I don't do my homework and fulfill my responsibility. It simply means that after having done all, I'm going to stand and wait upon the Lord for what he will say to me and how I shall say it. I, I envy uh, I don't envy Greg's job. <laughs> I know right now, historically, pastors are dropping out, committing suicide, and all kinds of uh, all kinds of negative things about leaders, all kinds of negative things about constituents, to tell you the truth. Uh, but uh, Greg, I'm picking on Greg right now, but his job is to be an expert. And he gets called into court as an expert. Forensic yeah, forensic accountant. And they'll beat you up. When you're called in as an expert on any subject, uh, the opposing argument is to make you look bad. And then in many cases, right, then later in a different case, they will hire you. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's the kind of response that God is looking for. He's going to have, he says, I'm going to have a word on my tongue that you didn't even pre-plan it. But even if you did pre-plan it, wouldn't it be wonderful to have somebody give an answer that the peace, the supernatural peace of God is on the answer? Oh, how about that? So that's our purpose. And after all, even the angels preach, glory to God in the highest and on peace, on earth, peace, goodwill toward men, toward men of goodwill. And if a son of peace is there and your peace will rest on it, if not, it will return to you. See, the one thing about maintaining peace or preaching forgiveness, nobody has to do it. Your obligation is to release it and make it available. The sons preach, the fruit of righteousness, obeying God's will in the fruit of the spirit is sown in peace by those who make peace. So Father, I believe you're gonna bring this church to a new dimension of peace. We're gonna watch you in a supernatural power and it's not a passive little mamby-pamby uh, attitude. It's actually quite, quite militant. And we're going to see victories that we've not seen before in areas. Watch out for the trip up. The trip up will be in your jurisdiction. It's to take matters into your own hands. That's where the trip up will be. You want to, rather than being under the rule of God, you let God rule. So, Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources, 
and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.